As I read these chapters, I, I kind of have to come up with an introduction, you know, to think about what, what is it really saying? What is really happening? What's taking place at that time? What is God doing with them? There's a lot of sorrow in Judah at this time. They're in a lot of pain. They're hurting. Children are being taken away from their parents. Uh, parents are killed, uh, their houses are burnt, the, the national monument, the temple itself, is totally wiped out and destroyed. The, they are taking the families and they're relocating them. Uh, they're putting them into Babylon, they're making them into slaves, they're, they're putting them into certain positions depending on what, what they can do and how they can use them. They're taking their lives away, their very lives away. They are becoming slaves in, in a literal sense. And when you think about all of that that's going on in their lives, you have to say there's a lot of sorrow. But through sorrow, and Paul really coined this in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, through sorrow, there is always an opportunity for us to be led to repentance. Because it's the pain and the suffering that we go through that forces us to look at ourselves and ask, what have I done? Or what have I not done? Or what should I be doing? Forgive me, Lord, for not doing those things. Forgive me, Lord, for being naive. Forgive me, Lord, for not taking steps that lead me forward in our relationship. It it causes us to look at ourselves and, and then to repent and turn from our sins, hoping that God will then restore what was taken from us, what was lost in our lives. And our God is good that he does, doesn't he? He does restore those things to us because he's a good God, a loving God and a caring God. And we have to remember that. That is his very nature because God is love, the Bible says. There is no hatred or deceptiveness in him whatsoever. And so this book is really about the sorrows of God, the sorrows of Jeremiah and the people. So let's go ahead and read chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, as we see the judgment of God come upon them. Now keep the context clear. I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath, speaking of God's wrath coming upon the people. He has led me to make, to made, and made me walk in darkness and not in light. So speaking here of Jeremiah, here he's walking, but it seems like nothing's making sense. You know, th- there's no obvious um, understanding. There's a little, it's a little cloudy, you know, as to what is God trying to do? What is God trying to say here? And so he's kind of in darkness. And surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones because of the, the famine, what was going on in the land. They were withering away. Their skin was withering up and turning black and their bones were showing. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. So you get the idea of the sorrow that this man is going through. He has set me in a dark place like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shouts out my prayer, or he shuts out my prayer. And so Jeremiah here seems to be thinking that God isn't listening to him. That God is kind of shutting him out, uh, turning uh, the other way in a sense because of the sins of Israel. And so he considers himself in this dark room where there's no no one around and there's just darkness, no light, no shining, no no hope, no glory. Just, Just doom and God isn't even paying attention. I think we've all been there at one point or another. I think that when you look at our country and our nation and what's going on today, you, you have to ask, are we headed in that same direction? And the answer is yes. Yes, definitely. Definitely. You know, the, the day that we took the Bible out of school was the day that we pretty much sentenced us to death. It really was. In the early, early days of our forefathers, they realized that the Bible was a very important book to be educated by. Not only did it teach you to read, not only did it teach you education, uh, geography, uh, mathematics, um, pretty much everything that, that, that we think and hold valuable, uh, it was the word of God and the power of God. And it led this great nation to do great things. But do you know what happened? 
in the early 1900s, psychology began to rise. And a, one man who was a psychologist went to the Supreme Court and says, we need to take the Bible out of school. And yet the Bible has been in school for all of these centuries, been used all these times, never have been objected, never have been proven to be wrong, never been proven to have any effects whatsoever. And this psychologist comes along who's an atheist and doesn't believe in God and says, the Bible I have found will definitely destroy the brains of our children. And the Supreme Court said, we can't do that. Let's take the Bible out. And that was the nail that sealed the coffin in our death. When we took that Bible out, we took out the truth of our nation, the truth of the existence of life. And thus, we see the results of that we see the results of children growing up without morality. Children's growing up without any direction. Uh, shortly after that was prayer, then the Ten Commandments, then anything religious, all taken out. Is our nation headed down the tubes? Of course it is. Of course it is. But we still have hope in God. So here's Jeremiah, and, and, and he's in this room in, in a sense, and he's in darkness, and he's just pleading with the Lord. He says in verse 9, he has blocked my ways and hewed stu- with huge stones. He has made my past crooked. He has been to me a bear lying in wait, like a, a lion in ambush. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent my bow and set me up as a target for the, for the arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule, ridicule of all my people, their taunting songs all day. He has Filled me with bitterness, he has made me drink wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. Yes, I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. So you see his despair. You see the sorrow as he views his nation, as he hears from his people. You know, we really need to think about where our hearts are. Now, as I said earlier when I first started, I understand that sensation of apathy, of of not being concerned with what's going on around us because I wasn't concerned about the things around us. The only thing that I was concerned about was my happiness, my own selfishness, and then my family, and then my immediate family after that. Those are important things to us as, as a nation, as a people, aren't they? Uh, your relationship with your wife and your husband and your children, very important to us. We value those things, and, and what happens to them is very important to us. Uh, though our children may not understand the love and the, the sacrifice and the work that we put uh, into the relationship because they're very selfish and self-centered. But when they grow up, they'll understand it. And we understand that. And then our immediate family, you know, those loved ones, those cousins and aunts and so forth. And, and, and we just kind of have this bubble that we like to live in. We need to take those lines and just really broaden those borders out there. There's a bigger problem than just ourselves, and it's affecting this nation. And we have the opportunity to change it if we will stand up, if we'll stand up and put our faith and trust in God and begin to change our lives, our perspectives, our ways, how we view things and allow ourselves to Submit ourselves humbly to the Lord and say, Lord, we want to believe what you believe. We want to know what you know. We want to apply your truth to our life so that we can be blessed, Lord. I'm no longer going to live my way. I'm no longer going to go my path. I want to go your path. I want to do what you want me to do so that you will bless me and my household and our nation. We need to get back to that. There's a lot of sorrow going on in our nation today. A lot of pain and suffering. Kids that are coming in from the border, they, they don't know any better. They're being pushed in there. The lines are drawn, but they're, they're pushing those lines and the, the immigrants are coming in to see where those lines are, are drawn. They don't know better. All they know is they're leaving their mothers and fathers. They're coming to the United States. And then you have all these adults screaming and yelling at these kids, you don't belong here. That's sad. That is sad. You have Hamas striking and killing Israelites. 
You have ISA killing Christians, American Christians, Iranian Christians, Iran Christians that have converted to Christianity. And in this country, we have the most silent killer, the most untalked about, that just stealthily comes in and destroys our nation, and that is abortion. 55 million children aborted. We're in a lot of trouble. And a lot of people are losing hope, like Robin Williams, depressed. What is going to happen to us in this world? Our taxes are going up. Our liberties are being taken away. Right now it's in the Supreme Court. They're, they're going to take away from the church. They're, they're hoping to take away from the church allowances for pastors. It's going to make it harder for pastors to, to serve in churches. And they're going after that. And they'll continue to go after that. And eventually it's going to be the 503C. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't change anything because God is still on the throne. And his word is still going to get out because men and women love the Lord enough to say, I don't care about those things. I'm going to preach the gospel no matter what. You know? And we need to change our mindset. We can't just, just dwell upon what is going on out there. We need to dwell upon the hope that we have in Jesus. So all of a sudden his mind just kind of turns around. He says, remember my afflictions and roaming, uh, the wormwood in the gull, verse 20. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. So it seems like he hits this bottom, but then all of a sudden he says, but I remember. I, I remember this about God. I think of the old days and how God has delivered. I think of what God has done with the children of Israel and his despair turned into hope. We oftentimes do that, don't we? When we first get into a situation, the first thing we do is we what? Look at the situation and we go, oh boy, I'm in trouble, am I? Am I not in trouble? I'm in big trouble. What am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? Who am I going to call? And then all of a sudden you went, wait a minute. Oh yeah, God, you're there. All right, God, you're going to work this out. Somehow you're going to work this out. I'm going to put my faith and trust you. Sometimes it takes a few hours or a day or two, but then we, we come to a realization and we remember who God is. I always like to remember who God is. Think about that throughout your week. Remember who he is. What has he done? Remind yourself. He he created the heavens and the earth. You know anybody that can do that? (laughs) I do, God. He created it all. And when he created it all, then he created man. He literally created us in his image. And then when they were in trouble, he, he divided a sea so they could walk through and be safe. And when they were hungry, he rained manna and quail from heaven so they could eat. This is our God who watches over us, and he can do these things. You know, in Israel, when they were shooting uh, rockets over to Israel, they had uh, three rockets uh, that fired over, and they have these uh, interceptors that will destroy the rockets, and they're pretty accurate, up to 200 meters. And they usually get them, although this one rocket was headed right for Tel Aviv. It was either headed to a location where it was like equivalent to our Pentagon or a hotel where there were going to be major casualties. So they fired up the interceptor, and it missed. Then they fired the next interceptor, and it missed again. And so the guy gets on the phone and says, send, send everything because there are going to be a lot of casualties. Seconds, seconds before, just two, three seconds, and there would have been casualties. As he's telling the people, get ready, a lot of casualties are coming. All of a sudden, an east wind came. It was, it was so strong that it took that rocket and dumped it right into the Mediterranean Sea. And the guy's on the phone going, I don't believe this. There is a God. This is a soldier that realized there is a God. God intercepted that thing. See, there's hope in God. When we remember who God is, remember what God has done in our lives, then we can hope that God has something good to work out in our life psalms twenty seven thirteen says i would have lost heart unless i had believed that i would see the goodness of the lord in the land of the living we need to change that change our perspective and keep that perspective of the lord that there's good coming through all these things in our lives god has something wonderful to work out in our lives as we go through our sorrows what happens is, is that we keep our thoughts and our minds on what the situation and we don't take our minds and thoughts off of that situation. You know, something's going on at work, so what are you thinking of? Work and that individual. 
in that situation. And you don't take your mind off of it. You keep dwelling upon it and dwelling upon it. You Finally, you have your dinner and you say, okay, I'm not going to think about it anymore. You watch a little TV to take your mind off it. And then you go to sleep and then you start thinking about it. And there you are at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, you're still thinking about it. Can you change it? No. Can you make any difference? No, you're trying to figure out a way to. And then you hear the alarm go off and you've been up all night and you've got to go back to work and then you, now you're in the situation again dealing with it. When we keep our minds on these things, that's when the stress, that's when the loneliness comes. That's when our lives are disrupted and even destroyed like Robin Williams when we keep our minds on what's going on around us. What we need to do is we need to forget about those things that we have no control about. We need to give those things to the Lord. Philippians says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and re- reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Look, I can't, I can't change what happened, but I can change what's about to happen. I can focus on God and what He will do, I I can't change that person's heart. I can't change their will. I can't go back, but I can go forward with the Lord and trust in him and walk rightly. We can do that. And when you do that, there's hope. There's hope in God. And he had that hope. He recalled in verse 21, this I recall to mine. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. Isn't that wonderful? Jeremiah realized that the mercies of the Lord was his hope. Because without the mercies of the Lord, we would be totally consumed. Because we are wicked people. We are self-centered, selfish individuals. I like the way um, Ken Greaves um, said it today. He says, can you imagine God coming to this earth and becoming one of us. How disgusting that is. Can't even imagine it, you know, as he would say. Can you imagine, and he goes off, finding a dead possum on the road, and it's laying on its side with its legs up, and it's bloated, and you go over there as a man and you kick it, right? Because I don't know why we do that, but we just kick it, you know? And all of a sudden it opens up and there are these maggots in it, you know? And it's been dead for a while. And would you ever think to yourself, those maggots are eating that flesh and meat and smells and the gases? And, but those maggots are important. Uh, I need to talk to them. Maybe I ought to be one of them. Maybe I ought to become a magnet just like them and go down there and see if I can communicate with them. Would you think of something like that? That's so repulsing and disgusting, isn't it? And yet here we are, a distance of maybe 10 feet, looking at magnets, magnets, maggots, you know? And and yeah, I wonder why, Lord. (laughs) And we would never think that, and yet... God and us, infinity, God knowing all things, created all things, and here are we, a bunch of magnets. <laughs> I don't want to say maggots. Some of you might get offended, but we are ma- maggots, aren't we? We're sinful, we're wretched. You know. And yet God became one of us to minister to us. That's mercy, that's grace, that's compassion that's unfailing. That's how much he loves us, and he didn't have to do that for us. That's the God we serve, and there's hope in that, Jeremiah said. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. The Lord is my portion, my, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Hope in the Lord. There's always hope as long as God's on the throne. Well, God's been around since eternity, so there's always hope. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the souls who seek him, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek 
to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Now he's talking about judgment. And he's saying, don't worry. You may be judged. You may be hit in the cheek. You will go through things. But don't worry. It's not forever. That's not our perspective. And as believers, our perspective is eternal, right? This life that we live down here and whatever sorrows that we go through is not forever. It's only for a while. And then when we get to heaven, that's forever. Sitting in the glory of God. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieved the children of men to crush under one's feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside justice, to do a man before the face of the Most High, nor or subvert a man in his cause. The Lord does not approve. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass? When the Lord has not commanded it, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Why should a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. There's hope in God. It is God who judges. It is God who distributes mercy. It's God who distributes woe. It's God who's in control. Now, you might not agree with that, and you might even think, well, that's really unfair that God would put us in this situation. You know what I say? Tough. (laughs) He's God. And who are we to think that we will fight against God? Jacob tried it, and he became crippled. And God just touched his hip with his finger, and that was it. He's God. You can't argue with God. He knows better. He knows so much more than you know. And he understands more things than you understand. He even knows what tomorrow's going to bring. Can you do that? No, we can't. And so we need to trust in him. He knows that he's going to work things out somehow in some way. And so Jeremiah calls, okay, Lord, if you are, and I believe you are, and there is hope in you, then I know that you can bring about an awakening. And so he says in verse 40, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Really, that's the key right there. Let us examine our ways. Paul said it in Corinthians 15, 33. He says, let us examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And so it's a self-examination. Where are we as a nation? We're not examining ourselves at all. We're just trying to please ourselves. We need to really stop. As Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, including myself, our purpose really is to glorify God. We were created to glorify Him, to please Him in every way. And if you are a believer, you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart, you realize you were a sinner, and you cannot obtain salvation without Jesus Christ, and so you've asked Him to come into your heart, you're saved. Definitely you're saved. But it doesn't stop there. There's more to it. Now God wants you to glorify him. He has, he has taken a great weight off of you. He has given you eternal life. And now he wants you to live for him so that men will see him in you and glorify your father in heaven, the good works that you do. But we stop there and we think, okay, I'm saved. Now I can go on with life and I can just work hard or I can just play hard and do these things. No, God has a greater plan for us, a greater purpose for us. There's hope. We need to examine ourselves. Where are we at right now? Where am I at right now? Can I do more? Can I serve more? Can I get involved? Lord, why have you called me? I mean, I'm saved, Lord. I know that. I believe in Jesus Christ. I know that my name's written in the book of life, and I know I'm going to heaven. But there's more for my life. What is it that you want of me? We need to ask him that. We need to plead with him those things so that he will open up the doors for us to walk through. Jeremiah says, let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. And so he's talking about their sin, their idolatry, serving the culture, being like the culture, and the culture now consuming them. In, this, in their rebelliousness towards the Lord. Acknowledging I have sinned against you, Lord. And yet the Lord's punishment will continue on. Then he goes back into the sorrow here in verse 43. He says, you, ha- you have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and not pitied. You have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. You have made us an offscoring and re- refuge in the midst of the people. 
All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and a snare have come upon us. Desolation, destruction. My eyes overflow with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughters of my people. My eyes flow and do not cease without interruption. Till the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes bring suffering to my soul because of all the daughters of my city. The beheading of of these children... Now you're starting to hear people saying, we need to stop posting this stuff. You know why? They're getting convicted. They don't want to deal with it. They'd rather it go away and not think about it, and yet it's happening. They just beheaded the, the reporter um, today that was uh, in prison there. They took him out and took a video, and they literally beheaded the guy. Wait till they get here. Wait till they get your daughter and your son, then you're going to start saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. Something needs to happen. We need to stop this. A little too late now. That's why we have to stand up now. That's why we need to do something now and not wait till it happens to us. And we have great power to do that. You know, we have such great power in our voting. You know how many votes are needed to change the presidency? So only 60 million, only 60 million votes. That's nothing. That is nothing with all the millions in the United States. In California alone, there are 23 million people. So right there is one third, just in California alone. But this is interesting. In California alone, only 23 million vote. I'm sorry, 13 million vote. So half of Californians vote. Now these are Christians that are supposedly voting, and of those 13 million that are Christians voting, only half of those really vote. And then those that vote, they don't even know what they're voting for. (laughs) They don't know what the initiatives are. They don't know who the people are. And and so they're looking at prosperity, no taxes, promises. They have no idea what they're doing at all. We have power to change what's going on in our world if we just stand up and vote. Now, I don't want to take a a show of hands, but let me just ask you, did you even vote this last June? And I'll bet you that less than half of us voted. See, we don't care. Yet we have this power and this ability as a free nation to make a difference, and yet we don't even use it. The number one reason that they found is people are too busy. I don't have the time to look into all these things. And that's why we as a church, we put on events. Like we have Craig Huey come out. And he literally uh, brings out the voter's guide that you get in the mail when you register. And it it has all the names in order that you have your ballot. So you just kind of go down whatever you look at and research and you just kind of mark them as you go and you put it in the box when you're done. He literally goes down right in order. And then he tells you, okay, this person, this is what he voted on. This is what the other person voted on. This is what this person believes. This is what this person believes. And then by doing that, you say, well, this guy has greater moral values. He's against abortion, which is murder. I know that. I'm not going to vote for someone that's, that, that's um, for abortion. So I like this guy. And so I mark it on my ballot. And when he's done, you have your ballot already marked a month before even election is done. Just do it here in one sitting, in one sitting. And if everybody here would would vote, it's amazing what could happen in our nation. I oftentimes will, my boys, you know, I'll text them, today's voting, you better go out and vote. You know, we're texting them until they say, yes, I did my voting, because we take it seriously. We have such a, a privilege to vote and make this nation into what God wants it to be and what it was before, and yet we don't even use it. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to empower you, to let you know you have more power than you think. You can change things. You might think not, but some of these votes that take place are very close, hundreds sometimes, just hundreds. And if a few people would just get up and vote, well, like I said, there are only 13 million out of the 23 million vote. Can you imagine if just another million voted, things would have swayed the other way. 
We make it that easy, and we need to stand up and, and do that. So he prays for deliverance, and we should be praying for deliverance of this great nation because it's going to get worse if we don't. My enemies without cause hunt me down like a bird. They silence my life in the pit and throw stones at me. The waters float over my head. I said, I am cut off. I called on your name, O Lord. From the lowest pit, you have heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from the sign, from, the, from my cry for help. You draw near on the day I called on you and said, do not fear. O oh Lord, you have pleaded the case for my soul. You have redeemed my life. O oh Lord, you have seen how I am wronged. Judge my case. You have seen all their vengeance, all their schemes against me. You have heard their reproach. O oh Lord, all their schemes against me, the lips of my enemy, and their whispering against me all day. Look at their sitting down and their rising up. I am their taunting song. Repay them, O Lord, according to the work of your hands. Give them a veiled heart. Your curse be upon them. In your anger, pursue and destroy them from under the heavens. Now, I love that prayer because it's a prayer that trusts in God to handle his situation. It's not a prayer that says, help me, Lord, to fight against this battle. Help me, Lord, to, to, to stand up with a sword and, and beat back these people. That's too late. Now, Lord, we need you involved. We're at a meeting today, and, and as uh, actually the last two days at this conference, and it was very encouraging to hear some of the, the testimonies of, of people and so forth that have gone through horrific things, and God has always been, been faithful uh, to be there. But while we were there, a miracle happened. There was a couple, they live up here in Apple Valley, and they have a little church there. In fact, the guy worked, actually still works for Edison, so we were just talking for a while. Well, while we were in this conference, he got a call from his son, and he ran out the door to answer the call. Turned out that uh, his children walked away from the Lord. Well, they got married, and now one of his sons is having a baby, they find out that the mother having the baby in the tubes, I can't remember the word for it, but it's not in a good place. It didn't fall into where it's supposed to be. And so he calls up and says, Dad, you need to pray. You need to ask God to help. Well, they were going to abort the baby. And they tried to abort it, but nothing happened. And so they said, well, we need to find out what's going on. So they normally don't do an MRI because then that kind of can affect the baby. But they decided, well, we're going to abort it anyway, so let's, let's do an MRI. So the dad's been praying. They've been calling on God. When they weren't calling on God, they did an MRI, and the baby fell into the right place. And the dad's just going, praise God. And the kids are going, there is a God. He hears prayer. You know, he hears prayer. God can deliver when we pray to him. And in those times where we have no recourse whatsoever, no control whatsoever, God intervenes in our behalf. And that's what makes him real in our lives. He has done that over and over and over again for us, hasn't he? He's done that for us. We were going to lose this building. We were going to literally lose this building. The guy was going to kick us out. You know, that's it. You're out of here. Leave, he said. Get out. And I'm like pleading with him, you know, why would you want us out? Let us just continue until you find someone else to purchase the place. Okay, but the rent's doubled now, you know. So we went from 1000 to, not doubled, but double cut in half. So 1500 you know, more. So I'm like, okay, well, let's do it until we find a place. Couldn't find a place. No place at all that we could afford, no school. It was going to be a hassle to move all this equipment back and forward. And God just instru- put everything in order, took, took control of it. And he turned this man's heart around where he came to us and said, you need to have this building. This community needs you there. And I need to help you. You see, because he came here to put a sign for sale on a Sunday morning. And he stayed for church. And I happened to be teaching about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he was very rich. He drove up in a Mercedes. He was so convicted. Afterwards, he says, you, you taught on that message just for me, right? I go, I didn't even know you were coming. And, and we go through the Bible, you know, verse by verse, book by book, you know, and so forth. It's like, oh, well, 
you guys need to have this church. And then he calls me Tuesday and he says, you know what, I need to help you get this church. Do you think I'll get to heaven? And he was scared because a word of God spoke to his heart. It wasn't me, it wasn't the people, it was the word of God that spoke to his heart because he knew the word was powerful. And the word of God says a rich man will have difficulty getting to heaven because they love their riches. He helped us. He literally wanted to charge us 200. We bought the building for 135. And then the Lord gave us the down payment because we didn't have it. He kept asking, do you have the down payment? And I kept saying, yeah, my dad has the down payment. My dad in heaven, I, we had nothing. And so, okay, as long as you have a down payment, yeah, we do. God does, you know. I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, God does. Please, God, I hope you do, <laughs> you know. Well, a guy that was still on the lean, he says, Pastor, I tell you what, if you let me hold the, the note for the first year, I'll lend you the $20,000. So he lent us $20,000, we paid the guy, and then he paid him off $90,000, and then we owned the building for the first year. And our payment went back to $1,000 a month. And then a year later, we refinanced, and our payment dropped down to $600 a month. So we got blessed because in times of need, in times where you have no control, in times when, when there's no hope, it seems, God comes in and does something great. That's the God that we serve. That is the God that we serve. He, he's wonderful in that way. Chapter 5. He just continues on with the... <clears throat> with his psalms he says how the gold has become dim how i'm sorry four that's chapter four right how the gold has uh, become dim how change the fine gold and stones of the sanctuary are scattered at the head of every street the precious sons of zion valuable as fine gold how they are regarded as clay pots the work of the hands of a potter even the jackals present their 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 beast as or to nurse their breast to nurse their youngs but that's not my phone hello i'm sorry Verse 3, where am I at? There we are. Even the jackals present their breasts to nurse their youngs, but the daughters of my people are cruel, like ostrich in the wilderness. Interesting, I, I didn't know this, but ostriches, they don't care about their offspring. They literally would just have their eggs and they're off and gone. They don't do anything about it. They don't come and take care of them, nothing. Uh, if, they, if an animal comes to attack it, they just they don't ignore it. They go ahead, it's yours, you know, type of thing. So you get the idea of how cruel they are to God's people in the wilderness there. The tongue of the infants cling, uh, cling to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Because of the famine, the children's tongues were sticking to their bread. You know, it's interesting because even though we're living in a time where, where kids are being raised without Christ, without Christianity being taught in the schools like it used to be, they're really parched for the gospel. They're really hungry for the word of God. We have an opportunity there with them. I guarantee you, if you really started to pray about some of the kids in your neighborhood, and if they play with your kids, just, just spend a couple of minutes and tell them, do you know about Jesus? I bet you, I bet you they will say, who's he? And then you get the opportunity to tell them. One of our kids here, now, I don't, I don't know, parents, if you know this or not, but if you have little kids and they go to our classroom, they get taught the gospel. We don't hold back. They get taught about Jesus, what he has done, and if they don't believe in Jesus, they're going to hell. Literally, they get taught this. So it might concern you. You might want to go back there and find out what they're being taught. Well, one of our little kids just went to start at school, right, this, this month, and he's already having problems with some of the kids there because they're bullies. And, and you know little Adam, Lopez, really nice little kid, you know, always here to men's breakfast and so forth. And so uh, he's, he just doesn't like trouble, you know, he's very calm. And so he comes home and says, Mommy, no one likes me. They're being mean to me. And so, of course, Mommy, oh, you know, okay, defensive, you know, protective and so forth. And so she says, well, you know, just try to be nice, try to find the right, right people. And so then the following day he goes back to school and she she picks him up and says, so how did today go? He says, oh, wait, it went really well. I have a friend. He says, oh, yeah? 
good. How'd you, how'd you meet him? Well, I was telling him about Jesus Christ coming into your heart and dying for the sins of the world and that if you don't receive him into your heart that you're going to the pit of hell. And so he accepted Jesus Christ because he didn't want to go to the pit of hell. And so he became my friend. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow, a soul was saved by this little kid. See, they get taught the word of God here and to preach the gospel message. And he made a friend because the guy was afraid to go to hell, you know. We have a great opportunity here with these kids if we reach out to them because they don't know Jesus. When my boys were little, I used to play, play with a neighbor down the street. Her name was Jamie, a girl. Uh, I was very protective of my kids, so I didn't allow them to go to other people's homes. They always played at my home. We had the pool. We had plenty of room. Like, plenty of people could come over and have fun, but we just didn't like them going to other people's house. So um, one day, um, the parents kind of were concerned about that. You know, why can't they come over to her house? There's something wrong with her, blah, blah, blah. And I had been talking to her um, for a while now. I asked her, I go, do you know Jesus? And she said, no, where does he live? She thought he lived in the neighborhood. I'm thinking, wow. They don't know nothing about Jesus. And see, they were the kind of parents that said, we don't push religion. She'll figure that out herself, and she'll make her choice. So they called us over to their house to talk to us about why our boys can't go over to her house and play with her kids. This is very mean, you know, blah, blah, blah. So here we are in their living room, and they're asking all these questions. And finally, I says, here's the reason why we protect our kids. We're Christians. And like, oh, you're Christians. And so I says, yeah, we're Christians. We believe in Jesus. I started preaching the gospel to them. And by the end of the day, they said, we want to become Christians. So I was kind of blown by it. So I just kind of just threw this out. I says, well, let's get on our knees and ask them into our hearts. And they said, okay. <laughs> and they got on their knees in their living room, all of us, Virginia and I. We got on our knees, we held hands, and they accepted Jesus Christ into their hearts. And from that day forward, they started going to harvest because we were in our home, I believe, at that time in a little Bible study. They started going to harvest, and his whole life changed completely you know, because of a little girl who didn't even know where, who Jesus was. You know. And right now, I think that it, it's a crucial time for us to reach out to these kids. We have a great opportunity to reach out because they're hungry for it. They want that bread of life. You know. Verse 5, those who ate delicacies are desolate. In the streets, those who were brought up in scarlet embrace ash heaps. The punishment of the iniquities of the daughters of my people is greater than the punishment of the sins of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment with no hand to help her. Isn't that interesting, their perspective? We're like that too, right? When we think, yeah, but they didn't go through this, you know? At least Sodom was, it was done. But we, we have to endure this for year after year a year 10 years 20 years 70 years you know i'd rather be like sodom and just get it over with if you're going to judge us you know. the, her nazarite <clears throat> her nazarites which were were men that took vows to serve the lord uh, staying away from drinks uh, not cutting their hair and so forth were brighter than snow and, and whiter than milk and they were more ruddy in body uh, than rubies like sapphires in their appearance, and now their appearance is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the street. Their skin clings to their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger. For those pine away, stricken for lack of fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They become food for them in the destruction of the daughters of my people. This stuff is coming, by the way. Maybe not now, but during the tribulation period, when God removes the church out of this world, this is what's going to happen during the tribulation period. People will have no food. If they do not receive the mark of the beast, uh, they will be starving. This happens, and it still happens. And we have reports of cannibalism because people are hungry and they want to survive. So they eat each other. And in this case, they ate their babies. 
The Lord has filled us, filled his fury and he has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion and it has devoured its foundation. Verse 12, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. They were so prideful. You know, uh, and we might be like that too. Oh, we're the United States of America. What are they going to do to us? And that's what they thought. We're Jerusalem. No one has ever penetrated our city. And they were surprised when it happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priest who shed in her midst the blood of the just. Now that's interesting. Not the people, but the leadership. The sins of the leadership is what brought this upon him. The priest. Those who were supposed to lead them by godly examples. See, the weight is on me. The weight is on leadership to be your example. If I don't believe this, how are you going to believe it? If it's not impacting my life, how is it going to impact your life? Now, I ask myself those questions. I really do. I, I, I have to. You know, I often wonder why our church is not bigger and more healthier. And I have to ask myself, is it because of me? Am I presenting the truth clearly enough? Maybe I'm not articulating it in the right way. Somehow I'm leaving something out. I'm not able to draw them into the truth and in that relationship with Jesus Christ that will cause them to grow. You know, and, and I feel like, am I one of those priests? Am I one of those you know, prophets? And there are those prophets and priests out there that are like that. They just profess it from the pulpit, but go live ungodly lives. I hope I'm the same out there when I'm at home, when I'm in my own household, that I am here. You know, I pray for the food here when I eat, and when I'm at home, I usually pray. And if you go out with me, I pray in public before I eat. And I try to follow the law as best I can. Sometimes I speed a little bit (laughs) trying to get to church, you know. I fall short in areas, but I try to be the same there as I am here. Reading the word, teaching the word, being in the word, and so forth. We need greater examples out there. And we don't have a lot of examples of this. We don't at all. Calvary Chapel has been making an impact in the political area a bit. In this meeting that I went to, there were a lot of Calvary chapels there <clears throat> because a lot of churches are not getting involved. They don't want to get involved. I don't know if you knew this or not, but in San Diego, during the time of the ballot of Prop 8, there was a huge church out there. I won't tell you which church it is, uh, but they got heavily involved in it. Well, they got sued. Uh, they won the case, but they lost millions and millions of dollars defending it. And because of that, He no longer wants to uh, support things like that because it affects their financial status, which is sad. Shows you where his heart is. I kind of look at it as, well, you took all my money, so what else can you take? I might as well continue to fight against you. (laughs) You I got nothing else for you to have, so you go have everything else you want, you know? But that's not the attitude. It's a mega church out there too, so. But it's sad. It's really sad that they fall back. They take a step back instead of going forward and fighting to the end. No, a man doesn't take his hands to the plow and then look back. We saw what happened to, to um, Lot's wife with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Uh, she was leaning back to the world and she turned into a pillar of salt. You know, shouldn't do that. So the sins of the prophets, they wandered blind in the streets, verse 14, and have defiled themselves with blood so that no one could, would touch their garments. They cried out to them, go away, unclean, go away, go away. Do not touch us when they fled and wandered. Those among the nations said they shall no longer dwell here. The face of the Lord scattered them. He no longer regards them. The people do not respect the priests nor show favor to the elders. Isn't that what's happening today? People don't respect pastors anymore like they used to. They used to be active in the government. They used to be active in the community. They used to be well respected. Now they're not because of all the sin that many have uh, uh, fallen into and given bad examples to. Still, our eyes failed us, watching vainly for our help in In our watching, we watch for a nation that could not save us. They tracked our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end was near. Our days were over. For 
our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the heavens. They pursued us on the mountains and they lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils and the anointing of the Lord was caught in their pits of whom we said under, the, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. So their only hope was in God but yet God had left them in judgment to this nation. And so we have a remnant that's still left pleading with God to help. And that remnant itself will be saved. God will not abandon Israel. Even to this day, God will not abandon Israel. Isn't it interesting how fickled we are as people? We are so fickle. I mean, we, we went from Hamas attacking Israel to Isa killing Christians to ALS ice challenge. That's social media. That's amazing. We're just so fickled in news and and reporting and so forth and what's exciting out there. And then we forget already Israel. We already forgot the Christians who are being beheaded. And now it's the ALS uh, ice bucket challenge and everybody's doing it, you know? And even in that, even in that, I did the ice bucket challenge. Someone challenged me, and so I did it and challenged a couple of the pastors. But I did not mention ALS, and I'll tell you why. Because ALS supports uh, uh, stem cell research for babies. They literally will take aborted babies or abort babies just for stem cell research. And that's, that's murder. So I won't support them. And yet there's Christians that don't know that, and they're on there supporting them and giving money. Unfortunately, we know it just happened on Sunday at a great crusade and they donated money to this organization that kills babies because we're uninformed and unaware of what's going on here. You know, we need to think about these things and what's important. Remember, O oh Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and wafts. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink, and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We have given our hands to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers sinned and no and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. That is happening today because of us as fathers and mothers we will set the scenes for our children if we don't do something now if we don't stand up now if we don't vote now we need to change california we have that power if we this november take the time to come out on that sunday when we have craig huey out and we look at the ballots and we stand up and vote, we can get rid of the governor of California and put someone in there that really cares about people and our children. We can do that. It's just a matter of standing up and making it happen. And that is an apportioned issue because if it happens here in California, California sets, sets the scene for every other state. It really does. And that's why there's so much concern for California and that we need to stand up for what's right and righteous. I understand that we have to live. I understand that we have to survive and, and support our family. I understand all that. And that makes sense. And that's, that's admirable and noble and loving. And, and there's respect for people that work hard and, and, you know, to, to take care of their family. But not at the cost of denying God because God should come first in our lives. He should be number one first. And if he's not number one first, then you're running into trouble. You're going to have problems in your relationships outside of God. He won't stand for that because he's a jealous God. He loves us so much and he wants our full attention at all times. Put him first and watch how much more you could do with God if you put him first. He says, servants rule over us and there's none to deliver us from their hands. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven because they were starving, because of the 
ferv of famine. They ravish the women in Zion, the maidens in the cities of Judah. Prince ha- uh, were hung up by their hands and elders were not respected. <laughs> I mean, this is a picture of exactly what's going on in, in, with Isa right now. You see pictures of people hanging by their hands. Their women are being ravaged and taken to rooms and raped and, and done all kinds of wicked things. Young men ground uh, at the millstone. You see bodies just in, in ditches just laying there because they're all killed and so forth. Boys staggered under loads of wood. The elders have ceased gathering at the gate. And the young men from their music. The joy of our hearts have ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. The crowns have fallen from our heads. And woe to us for we have sinned. Because of this our heart is faint. Because of these things our eyes grow dim. Because of Mount Zion which is desolate with foxes walking about it. Uh, Why are the foxes walking about? Because they're eating the corpses, the carnage that's around there. You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will restore. Renew our days of old. In other words, may you turn us back to a love for you. Unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry, with us, and so you see that darkness that's still upon him, you know that concern for his people, not knowing what God is doing, but we know God, we know God today in the New Testament, in this day and age, we know our God is good, and we know our God can turn things around, and he can do it this election, if we stand up and make our voices heard, if we get equipped, if we try to understand as hard as that might be, and you don't want to waste time, and ah, I'm not going to make a difference, you do make a difference. But beyond that, you are being faithful to what God has called us to do. Really, God's called us to vote? Yes, he's called us to vote. Romans 13 talks about the government being established for the protection of his people. Well, how do you think they're going to protect his people? Because his people vote those people in to protect them. But if we don't vote them in, they're not going to protect us. And they're not. They're taking everything away from us because we are not doing our due diligence by voting. And taking a stand. So I hope that you see what has happened with the children of Israel, with Judah. And I hope you see what's going on in our world today. The same thing. But we can make a difference if we stand up.